episode four of the horror geeks. Like the little uh my little Whoa, little where did finger. you get that? Dude, we might be getting some notice. Stars Stars sent that to you? Stars sent this to me. I mean, the return address said stars. Is probably maybe we just have a fan in the mailroom or something. It's like a hunchback quasimodo guy, a phantom of the opera, like running around the mailroom. Maybe. Taking notice of the horror geeks. Maybe. Horror geek cast. But maybe stars, maybe we're on the radar. We'll see. Oh, I love Ash vs. Evil Dead. When's it coming back? I wish tomorrow. I know. We gave peace a chance. Now it's time for war. This episode, I could not be more excited. I feel like... I'm pretty pumped. I feel like a little boy just wanting to scream. We're doing (laughs) Tales from the Crypt. (laughs) Tales from the Crypt. Tales from the Crypt is just so so near and dear to my heart. I mean, it was a big part of my childhood. I mean, a really big part of my childhood. We also have two of our fellow horror geeks with us today. Yes. Jose is back, but we also have Sarah. Oh, we have Sarah today? We do have oh, Sarah Oh my goodness. Today. Wow. Her first appearance on the show, Sarah Nicklin. She's going to be doing a top 10 with us, awesome. which is her top 10 favorite Scream Queens. And then she's going to stick around and do the bloody bonus. So Andy, you disappeared. <sighs> I and did. then you came back, seemingly out of the closet. Turns out your closet is a rift into another dimension. It's called a quantum filament, actually. It leads to a conduit to another part of the multiverse, overseen by a deity. Her name's Angela, and she so desperately wanted new experiences because she's experienced everything over trillions of years, and she was alone. So here I come in, and she notices me and uses me as an avatar to experience our reality. She's a powerful goddess, very mother-like, one of mercy and love. She had experienced every element of her universe, and when I stumbled upon, she saw a great opportunity to expand her awareness. She experienced through me so many great things, and she in turn showed me heaven. But she wanted more. And despite all of her love, there was so much longing and so much fear that she would never be satisfied, that she would never be fulfilled. And despite her omnipotence, there was a childlike petulance to her, an insatiable naivete. My body and and soul couldn't handle the torque of her need and her boundless hunger. And I pleaded and I pleaded with her, and eventually she realized that my mortality was at stake, and I was eventually spat back out into Barry's living room. Here I am. But I still feel a psychic bond with her, a connection, a tether to her, and I know that at a moment's notice she could pluck me back, and I would have no say in the matter. That is, uh, that is quite the tale. Um, so yeah, your closet, man. Uh, you know, I was just gonna go in there just to, uh, you know, get a photo with Gizmo for you know, Facebook purposes. I, I, I told you not to do that. I wanted a photo with Gizmo. I mean, I can't really fault you. Who wouldn't want a photo with Gizmo? I know, I really... He's so cute. He's so cute. I but... Just, I just love him. Have you heard anything from Charlotte? Because she didn't show up for last episode. I, I have no idea where she is, where she's been. Well, Barry, I mean, you uh, you, you kind of you kind of weirded her out a little bit. I'm not going to lie. Wait. She she really likes the show, and she feels that she, you know, she fits in. She was creeping me out. Didn't you see what she was doing to me? None of that was real. You were manifesting all that in your imagination. She was just sitting there and, like, waiting to, you know, be called on, and you were just staring at her, and I had to keep... Deviating your attention back to the show. I mean, it was really awkward. Thank you, Carolyn. You dance wonderfully. Oh, I'm so excited. Let's talk some tales from the crypt. Kind of two sides of Tales from the Crypt. Actually, there's three. There's the feature films, a couple in the early 70s, a couple in the mid-90s. But most of us think of the television series, starting in 89. But you can't really get into the television series without talking about the comic book. Right. Now, Andy, were you a big comic book fan as a kid? You know, I, I was. I was more your traditional Marvel and DC, you know, uh, superheroes. 
Well, when I was a kid, I mentioned this last episode when Jose was with me for episode three when we did a uh, shot on video and we talked about VHS. Huge part of my childhood was going to my dad's every weekend and we'd stop in this one town and go to the comic book store. I probably didn't get introduced to the EC horror comics until maybe I was around 13 or 14. A little bit of history into the comic books. EC stood for education educational comic books when it was first found originally right by max Gaines, i want to say in 1944 it sounds right and they did like bible stories that did not sell well i mean max Gaines was already rich at this time like he got in on the superman thing at the ground level but he passed away in a i think a boating accident in 47 and his son william or bill Gaines, took over and he wanted to take the company in a different direction. He renamed it uh, Entertainment Comics. Good move. <laughs> and then he hired an editor and artist, Al Feldstein. And they realized they had a mutual love for horror. And a lot of that was based on radio shows from, right. I want to say, the 30s. And one that I think I remember they listened to was something called Lights Out. Lights out. Everybody. William Gaines and Al Feldstein decided to start doing horror. So and cool. they started slipping their new horror stuff into their existing publications, which were a lot more crime story based. Right. Like noir. Like crime pulp stuff. Right. Noir stuff. Yeah. And then Murder their mysteries. sales started skyrocketing. Those EC comics were so influential on some of our, you know, horror legends. That we know, like right. John Carpenter and George Romero. And to keep the same spirit alive of those books in movies is, was great. I, I would say that the movie like The Fog is a direct connection to EC. I discovered EC Comics when I was a kid, um, and they weren't allowed in the house. I would smuggle them in and, you know, the, the classic thing, get under the covers with a flashlight and read them. We're children of the 80s and 90s, and they're children of, like, the 50s and 60s, where uh -huh. that stuff was really big. And even, uh, you know, Creepshow and Tales from the Dark Side, they, they pay direct homage. We just tried to have as much fun as we could and make it really look like a comic book. But like all good things, they must come to an end. And the comic books started getting a lot of heat. attention, heat. There was a psychologist, Wortham, I think was his name. That sounds right. And uh, started saying, oh, these are bad for your kids. and Pollute these... your mind. Yeah, he was tying it to the rise in juvenile delinquency. Right, like reading these comics would literally make you go out and do horrible things. Yeah, in the 50s. Not true. We talked about this a little in episode two, about how in the 50s there was kind of this... Prim and proper. Like, image, yeah. and it, that couldn't be shattered. Right. And white America was worried about all the kids, like, being violent. Now, yeah. those comic books did get pretty violent. I think the one that finally sent him over the edge was the baseball tale where they murdered oh, yeah. a baseball player and used his entrails. What was that one called? Baselines. I think it was called Foul Play. Foul Play. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> but they're like, no, let's not tell the, tell the cops. Let's just kill the kill guy. <laughs> yeah. And it actually led to Senate intense. subcommittee hearings. Yeah. Bill Gaines actually went and testified, and a lot of people thought that was that were in that supported him thought that that was a really bad move for him to do. Yeah, well, apparently that's kind of what made him the target, and he became, and I think that's what he wanted. He said, okay, this is my movement, you know, so yeah. I really wanted to take responsibility. Oh, and props to him. I was the first publisher in these United States to publish horror comics. I'm responsible. I started them. Some may not like them. That's a matter of personal taste. It would be just as difficult to explain the harmless thrill of a horror story to a Dr. Wortham as it would be to explain the sublimity of love to a frigid old maid. He fought back hard. Oh, I mean, there was this sort of, the comic book industry decided to self-police themselves and they came up with oh, the, the comic, code. Yeah, the yeah. comic book code. Which was like, you can't have anything cool or fun. Yeah, no blood, all. no gore. They even like targeted the title and said like, you couldn't have terror in the title. Claims that these comic books are going to turn uh, us kids into juvenile delinquents. Well, poor guy, I have news for him. They turned me into a movie director. Bill Gaines kept fighting, but eventually the economic pressures succumbed and they quit all their horror comics. Yeah. And EC actually Disbanded, folded. yeah. And the Crypt Keeper was dead. Well, but more dead. 
not for long. <laughs> Jose, man, you're back from Comic Con. I'm back. I survived. Uh, I survived uh, three full days uh, in San Diego for Comic Con 2017. I got some really cool swag, some Stranger Things hats That's right here. Cool. Um, we got to watch an Arl Stein panel. Is he still writing books? He's still writing books. at three hundred plus uh, wow. as of the, this past weekend. Fun fact: he writes with one finger. Go home. So I saw a lot of cool stuff, and I put together a little video of some of the uh, horror goodies I discovered uh, while at Comic Con. Check it out. Hey guys, I'm here in sunny San Diego for Comic-Con 2017. Let's go find out what horror offerings are in store for us horror geeks at Comic-Con. You have a chance to win a face hugger of your own. Uh -oh. This is good. Disappointed you didn't buy me one of the alien eggs. Well, the alien eggs uh, were technically not for sale. I think they were a, a raffle situation. However, I did buy myself a lot of things, so I, I consider <laughs> Comic Con very successful. And while I was buying myself something, I got you a little <gasps> something to put on your wall. What? I got you a little Jason, oh, little freaky guy. My god he is so to, uh, cute to, de to decorate the uh, the horror geeks wall of, of shame back to the show we mentioned this uh, a little bit earlier but some of what we know as really successful directors and producers who loved uh, those shows right so joel silver who was a mega producer at the time lethal weapon lethal weapon die hard die hard he purchased the rights to the ec comic library and then made the unforgettable movie weird science with anthony michael hall <sighs> thank you joel kelly lebrock and then he teamed up with robert zemeckis and richard donner Initially, they wanted to do a movie, but right. then they talked to HBO and decided to turn it into a television Which series. is a stroke of genius. I honestly don't know that a lot of people realize, like, yes, it was on HBO, which that HBO then was not HBO now. It was you a know, fledgling there was, there was no thing. HBO Go or anything. Yeah. It was like, you know, you had to subscribe. And right. so not a lot of people had it, but Tales from the Crypt was, like, the first real horror TV series. I really feel like they're kind of these twisted Aesop fables. Oh. You know, to go back to the censorship, I really feel like they got it totally wrong. They were indeed going there and taking you to the dark place in a safe way. Yeah. Making puns and jokes. and But they weren't teaching people to do these terrible things. In fact, the, the main character, and this is what's really cool about the show too, is that the main character, and you're behind the eyes of the main character, is usually the monster. And yeah. is and is usually getting their just desserts and they're getting their comeuppance. Yeah. And it's not like, oh, go out and do these horrible things and it's going to work out for you, kid. 
Like it's it, totally the opposite. Yeah. Like I wish somebody at the in the courtroom was like, guys, you totally got this backwards. Like they are saying that if you murder your wife, you murder your husband, you do this, you do X or Y, you're a gold digger, you're just in it for the money, blah, blah, blah. It's not gonna end out well for you. You know, you've yeah. you've gotta be a good person and you've gotta treat other people with respect. And it's a dark way of showing what not to do. Well, speaking of morality and morality tales, one of my favorite episodes is Lover Come Hack to Me, starring Amanda Plummer, who you guys might, might remember from Pulp Fiction. Any of you f- pigs move, and I'll execute every mother f- last one of you. I want to say this is kind of a chick flick. <laughs> Don't you that, think? That one is a bit of a tech flick. I, I mean, mean, the guy's the guy's gonna kill the girl for money, got the gun, but then the girl like then the girl gets her like, baby, uh, kills him, with and an she axe. kills him just like her mama did. Yeah, mama, it's a daughter. Sleep tight, Charles. The axe from Lover Come Hack to Me is, I believe, the same prop axe seen in one of my other favorites, Came the Dawn. If it's not the same axe, it looks exactly the same. So Kim yeah. the Dawn co-stars uh, Brooke Shields, who I think just did an amazing job in that episode. She killed it. She, <laughs> she got killed, but she, she, did. she killed it as well. She killed it, and then she got <laughs> and killed. And got killed. It's got a little bit of, like, psycho element. Yeah, there's too. a lot of psycho in the end where uh, we find out that he's the... And it's, again, to touch on the twists and turns and the brilliant kind of game of Tales from the Crypt in the comics and in the show is that it's like, you're with the monster, but maybe he's not the monster, or he, she's not the monster, and then you have another character, and then it's like, oh, well, they're definitely the monster. And then brilliantly at the end, the reversal, and then very much the Norman Bates cross-dressing. Yeah. It's almost like his mind fractured into this, you know, the guy who's lonely, but he's lonely because his dark side has kept him lonely yeah. because he's killing off everyone that gets close to him. Now, to flip that a little bit back and go into another one of my favorite episodes, we know from the beginning that this guy is not a very good guy, and that is Death of Some Salesman with Ed Bakley Jr. This is probably... If not my favorite, one of my top three. You know you're with a, a sleazy guy. He's ripping people off. It's horrible. He's selling plots of land in a cemetery to these like poor people. But then they put him in a situation where you feel bad for exactly. him. Exactly. Because the yeah. thing that's known the most about that episode is Tim Curry playing three different roles. Amazing. So he goes into this family that turns out to be a psychotic family that kills door-to-door salesmen. Perfect. And they want, they want to see if their daughter, Winona... Wants to marry him, and dude, there's like the one of the most awkward sex scenes ever. Oh my god, dude! I I never laughed so hard and wanted to throw up so bad at the same time in my life. <laughs> I, it was um, unbelievable. But the body never lies. If someone put a gun or an axe or some weapon to my head, and said, what's your favorite episode, Andy? I'd probably say All Through the House, and All Through the House. So Mary Allen Trainer just does such a good job as a murderess yeah. that you still care for. And that's so brilliant. You still are like on the edge of your seat, like, oh, what's going to happen to her? What's going to happen to the kid, the innocent kid, yeah. who ends up ironically bringing in Santa at the end? Oh, my God. And her screaming at the end is so heart-wrenching, yet you, like, <laughs> you know she kind of gets what she deserves, but still. Uh, and, you know, the husband's kind of a jerk. What did you say? What are you, deaf? I said, let me have it. Merry Christmas, you son of a bitch. Another tragic flaw character is the one played by Demi Moore in Dead Right, oh, which man. is my other like co-number one favorite episode. Demi Moore and Jeffrey Tambor, who... I, I would like to see the documentary on this, just the prosthetics, His prosthetics that he yeah. had to have gone through. And just a really quick uh, summary, Demi Moore is a secretary. She's always, you know, just kind of wanted to marry someone rich to make her life easier. To get out of the doldrums, the boredom. Yeah, and this fortune teller tells her that she's going to marry this large man. Uh, Physically shortly, large. Shortly after they get married, he's going to inherit a bunch of money, and then after that he'll die and then, of course, in true Tales from the Crypt fashion, like, the fortune teller was right, but it ends but up it's a twisted, twisting yeah. back, and Demi Moore gets murdered. By him. By him. If I can't have you, 
Oh man, what a gripping scene. It's heart wrenching. Uh, yeah, it's brilliant. Good evening. I'm Chase Conroy. And in addition to sports tonight, I'll also be doing the weather, as famed Channel 13 Horror Town News meteorologist Barry Amater was brutally murdered today in the latest of a string of surprising, mysterious, heart wrenching, and horrid murders are taking place and hitting quite close to home as mostly they're targeting Channel 13 Horror Town News team members. My heart goes out to you, Barry. Rumors have been swirling that the HPD is, in fact, not targeting Jason Voorhees as he hasn't been seen by anyone, except for my wife, for several weeks. And now on to weather. There was a strange mist that was identified on the outskirts of town today. Despite reporters' claims that it is indeed real, the mayor of Horror Town has decided that they are indeed not real. When pressed for further comment, the mayor transitioned into his original demon form and threatened to suck their souls out with a boba straw he got at the 7-Eleven. Ah! And now joining me for sports is famed fight promoter, Cutter Stone. Oh yeah, brother. How we doing? Cutter, great to be here. Thanks oh, so much. Great to be me. How you doing? How you doing? So what, what is it, what is it you would like to tell the, the fine people of Horrortown about this evening? Well, we got a fight coming up. The greatest fight of all time. Alien vs. Predator! This is going to be the ultimate fight, my friend. I'm pretty sure that this has, uh, this has been done before. In fact, it's pretty what? well-worn territory. There's a, a, a movie, to two, in fact. No, uh, no, 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 no. An Movies? entire series of comic books about this. This is, this is nothing new. No, no, no. Look, let me tell you. Lance Henriksen's going to be there. No one's seen them together. Now that's a fight. <laughs> yeah, sure. This is what? for my son, Jason. And now, the top ten. I'm so excited, you guys, to have Sarah Nicklin with us. She, along with Andy and Jose, was one of the hosts of the Horror Geeks pilot that we did, and I know we've mentioned that before, <laughs> but it's so good to have you here on Thank you. The Geek Cast. I'm excited to be here. Sorry it took so long. Jeez. <laughs> no, that's that's all right. We've been we've been checking schedules and <laughs> shuffling things around. Now we wanted to do top ten scream queens. Yes. But that is a term that's not easily defined. Let's say. Yeah, it's a term that's kind of it's it's thrown around loosely, and it has different meanings for different people, and also can be fairly controversial depending on who you are calling a scream queen and what that p person perceives the term scream queen to mean. Yes, uh, absolutely. So I am a big fan of the Socratic method <laughs> in which before we talk about something, we define what we're talking about. So scream queen, what are some of the ways that sort of people think about that? Well, I think, well, for me, at least, a Scream Queen is a female protagonist that is in a series of horror films or horror TV shows, horror properties in general. I think at first, in the like late 70s, early 80s, Scream Queen was women in horror films, mm -hmm. in multiple horror properties. But then as low-budget filmmaking kind of evolved, I feel like Scream Queen became more of a negative moniker that was a, a, attached to women in low-budget films that were willing to get naked and run around with their tops off screaming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hence the term Scream, scream Queen. Not so. <laughs> that, that there's anything wrong with Nothing that. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's dive into your top ten. Sure. So, number 10, Sigourney Weaver. She appears in several horror films, sci-fi horror films, but still horror films nonetheless. Yeah. Even though she doesn't do a whole lot of screaming and she's a badass. <laughs> number 9, I'm going to pick Debbie Rashawn. Ah, trauma sweetheart. <laughs> exactly. So, Debbie is more of a, a modern day scream queen where she's extremely prolific. She started off in a lot of the trauma films and um, like Tromeo and Juliet and the Toxic Avenger. And she has continued to work and has 
well over 200 credits. <laughs> Janet Lee. Janet Lee, we all know her as uh, Marion Crane in Psycho. And we actually talked about on episode two, that shower scene, in my opinion, being the most famous scene ever in a horror movie. Absolutely. It's super iconic. And you can't think of horror, especially classic horror, without thinking of that scene. Number seven is Asia Argento. <sighs> Oh, you just made me melt. Oh my goodness. Those of you who maybe not don't know Asia Argento, you probably re definitely recognize her father's name, Dario Argento, one of... And if not, shame on you horror fans. <laughs> Danielle Harris. Danielle. It's hard to argue with her. I mean, her career trajectory... So interesting. Halloween 4 and 5, after the Halloween movies, moved to more studio stuff, but then kind of came, came back, back to, her, to horror. her roots. Number five, Amy Steele. Oh, One of your favorites. Melted my heart again. <laughs> Not necessarily a prolific horror actress. No, but very iconic. Yes. In, in some of the most memorable horror films. Yeah. Of all time. Barbara Crampton. Ah, Barbara. From Beyond, Reanimator, yeah. Chopping Mall. She has remained extremely active. There is an article out there about that Barbara Crampton, she either wrote or was interviewed, where she talks about the term Scream Queen and don't refer to her as a Scream Queen because of the term that that, the connotation that that term has taken on, which yeah. means that She's not a good actor, though. Well, but sorry, Barbara. We did use it. You but are one. But, but it we're means using it in a it good a, way. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Number three, Nev Campbell. Ah, uh, can't think about the '90s without thinking about Nev Campbell. No. Scream. Well, multiple screams. Craft. I mean, she she was a staple of pop culture horror yeah. in the '90s. <laughs> Number two, Jamie Lee Curtis. She's a big it, one. It couldn't be a top 10. It couldn't be a top five without, <laughs> without Jamie, Jamie Lee Curtis. Curtis. What most of us think of as a scream queen, it, it is her. It is, yeah, it is Jamie Lee Curtis. <laughs> My favorite, personally, is Vera Farmiga. I think she is absolutely fantastic in every single thing that she does. And she's in so many really quality horror productions. From The Conjuring to Bates Motel, playing Norma Bates, vulnerable, manipulative, and strong all at the same time. Like, yeah. it's really, I, I don't think you can really find a more quality Scream Queen. Well, all right. We, I could talk about Scream Queens <laughs> all day and definitely talk about Asia Argento and Amy <laughs> Steele all day. But unfortunately, we're out of time. Yeah. I think you're going to be able to stick around with us for the bloody bonus. We'll find out. All right. <laughs> They're the dead. They'll continue living. I'm so sad. It's the end of this episode. I know. It went so fast. I could talk about Tales from the Crypt for hours. Days. Years? Weeks. Months. Maybe uh, Years might be a little too long. Eons. May maybe in the afterlife. There you the go. The Keeper and I can just Chill. hang out. Just play board games. Oh, what's this? Yeah. Oh, that, that Charlotte. That, yeah, she. Okay. Oh, yeah. Pookie she, Bear. Oh, love me tender, love me sweet. Who says that? Are you, Barry? What are you? You guys are having sex. Okay. All right. I. I. I admit. I admit. I've started a relationship with her. Schnookums. 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 Okay, I'm coming clean. I've been You're having, unbelievable. I've been having a relationship with her. Ah. I can confirm, Andy, that in fact she is a succubus. <sighs> but the sex is great. <laughs> Oh,